Okay, so we get a lot of questions every day, every week, every month about gas detection. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the gas detection using the Q5 and B5 series of sensors. We're going to talk about the most common gases used, uh, sensor applications, gas area positioning, network diagrams, and again at the end we'll have a question and answer seminar uh, session. Hopefully this will be informative. So the Q5 and B5, even though they're two different sensors, they are basically the same. Uh, we're going to go over the similarities first. Um, the Q5 and B5 are available in toxic or combustible gases. They have three programmable relays with preset factory defaults in them. Uh, they can be used either as a room sensor or a duct sensor with the optional duct mount kit. Uh, they have an easy to use interface, an LCD backlit display with five status LCDs, two for the RS-485 transmit and receive, and three for relay status that will turn red when the relay is tripped. And they also have three sensing keys on the faceplate for easy programming. Uh, the Q5 and B5 are ETL listed, and the Q5 B5 CO sensors are UL2075 listed. Uh, the Q5 B5 have a three to five year typical lifespan and 18 month for oxygen. Uh, they have a very nice feature with that have a replaceable sensor module for easy maintenance, and they come with a two year warranty. Now the Q5 can be used as a standalone controller. It has an analog output signal of zero to uh, four to 20 milliamp, one to five or two to 10 volts. Uh, it can be used with the M controller or Q4C controller using RS-485 Optimex protocol, or it can use RS-485 Modbus RTU communication direct to your front end. Now the B5 is a backnet sensor uh, it uses BACnet MSTP serial communication directly to your front end. Uh, it is configurable as master or slave, but it comes default as master. Uh, it has user adjustable baud rates, addresses, instance numbers, and the relays can be controlled via BACnet communication. So the most common gases we get uh, calls about are going to be hydrogen, uh, methane, oxygen and the two that go together, NO2 and CO in the parking garages. Now the Q5, B5 come in a variety of different gases as shown here. Uh, if you want the whole list, I recommend that you go to our website at workaci.com and download the data sheet for either the B5 or the Q5 and that'll give you a full list of all the gases that are available. So gases use three different ways of being detected. Uh, percent by volume, parts per million, and 100, 0 to 100% LEL, or lower explosion limit. So we're, we're familiar with uh, percent by volume. That's uh, you know 1% of the volume. You divide by 100%, that'll give you your percent. Uh, one part per million is going to be 1 divided by 1 million. Uh, the most common gas that we, that we recognize as being measured in percent by volume is oxygen, which is 20.8%. Uh, the second way that is going to be uh, measured is parts per million. We're all familiar with that, especially if we deal with CO2. Uh, one big question that we always get asked is, how do I convert percent by volume to parts per million? And that's very easy because 10,000 ppm equals 1% by here. If you have 2.7% by volume, we just multiply that by 10,000 and you can get your parts per million. Now the third way, and this is, has to do with combustible gases, is we measure 0 to 100% LEL, or lower explosion limit. Now the lower explosion limit is at that point where there's enough gas and oxygen mixture that if a, an ignition source is introduced, you're going to have an explosion or a fire. So when we're dealing with combustibles, we do not want to get to that 100% LEL level. So in our example right here, we're using methane. Uh, methane has a lower explosion limit of 5% by volume. So as you can see up here, 0 to 5% by volume is going to equal 0 to 100% LEL. Uh, combustible gases also have an upper explosion level, and methane is 15%. 
So any, anywhere in between this 5% and 15%, uh, the gas and air mixture combination will be combustible or explosive. So we really do not want to be here. Uh, anything below that 100% LEL is going to be le too lean to burn. Anything above the upper explosion limit or UEL is going to be too rich. So we definitely want to make sure that we do not get to the 100%. So some of the different applications uh, we come across, uh, people ask about and where gas can be used is fleet service or automobile garages or city garages. Uh, some of the different places would be truck service centers. Uh, you would monitor for NO2 or natural gas because you know, some trucks and like taxi fleets used uh, natural gas or propane. Uh, car or truck dealerships for uh, CO and NO2, uh, even independent garages. Uh, industrial occupant safety and combustibles. Uh, you would use like a methane sensor for uh, mechanical rooms, boiler rooms. Uh, gas detection would be used in process industries. Uh, hydrogen would be a good place for using in forklift charging stations or uh, big companies like uh, uh, servers that have battery rooms for a full battery backup for the whole building. You want to monitor that hydrogen or, and restaurants and uh, pool areas for carbon monoxide. Uh, just a couple months ago, there was a, a big story out, out east where a pool heater uh, broke and was releasing carbon monoxide into the pool area. And uh, unfortunately, there were, uh, I believe, a dozen kids were sick and, and one, one child was, uh, was passed away because of that. So that's a really good area for putting a carbon monoxide sensor. Uh, another application is oxygen enrichment and oxygen depletion. Now, normal oxygen is about 20.8% by volume. Uh, oxygen depletion is considered less than 19.5% by volume. So when oxygen is displaced by other gases, you know, such as carbon di dioxide, is when oxygen depletion happens. Uh, a good place for oxygen sensors for, for oxygen depletion would be sewage plants uh, for safe storage of liquids and chemicals. And here at ACI, we use an oxygen sensor to monitor the nitrogen tanks that we use for our selective soldering machine. Uh, oxygen enrichment is anything over 20.8% by volume. Uh, when, it, when oxygen is richer, it increases the chance for flash fire or explosions. So the most common areas for that would be hospitals or labs. Uh, natural gas and leak detection, this would be uh, boiler rooms and truck repair shops for methane, uh, forklift stations for, uh, for, you know, that use forklifts that use propane or natural gas. And again, restaurants, because they use natural gas for their grills and CO for the exhaust. The application that we get most questions about are going to be parking garages. Uh, CO, NO2 ga uh, gas detection is where we would talk about here. Another good place for CO and, and NO2 sensors would be anywhere that you have idling vehicles like uh, bus stations, uh, loading docks, outside airports, you know, any place where there's going to be vehicles running. Now, a big question we have is, you know, where do I mount these? How high do I mount these? For most part, uh, the Q5, B5 will cover about 7,500 square feet depending upon the gases. As you can see here, there are a couple like chlorine and chlorine dioxide that's only 5,000 square feet. But for, for today's webinar, we're going to use a 7,500 square foot range. A mounting height is going to depend upon the gas. Some gases are going to be lighter than others. Some gases like ammonia and hydrogen are going to be lighter than air, so you're going to mount them up high, 6 to 18 inches below the ceiling. And there are other gases such as chlorine and NO2 that are going to be heavier, so you're going to mount those 6 to 18 inches above the floor. Uh, carbon monoxide is kind of a neutral gas, so that's going to be mounted in the breathing range about 4 to 6 feet above the floor. Now, NO2 can also be mounted in the breathing zone. 
uh, based upon what type of vehicle is going to be in a, in a service garage. Uh, for instance, uh, city buses or semis have their exhaust coming out the top. So you can mount that NO2 sensor alongside of a, a let's say the CO sensor and catch that gas and detect it as it is coming down before it builds up on the floor. So this, this chart, this gas area and positioning chart is available on our website at workaci.com that uh, you know, anybody can go and download that for their reference. Now here's a typical layout that we have of a parking garage. Uh, each one of these circles represents a, a CO and NO2 sensor mounted together. Each one of these circles is going to be 7,500 square feet. And as you can see, to get the best coverage, all these circles are going to overlap. And that's what, you, that's what we're looking for to make sure that the gas detection is going to cover the whole garage. Uh, just for kind of a reference, a uh, 7,500 square foot circle is going to be about 96 feet in, di in diameter. Now, in addition to parking garages, there are also other opportunities, such as smaller repair shops that are going to be 7,500 square feet or less. Uh, we recommend that you still use two sensors for redundancy in case one of them, one sensor goes bad. One sensor can be mounted over on one side of the building and the other on the other side, just to make sure that if one sensor goes, is bad or you know, stops working, there's another sensor there to pick up the gas. So here are some pictures that we took on how our sensors would be mounted. Uh, the picture on the left here is in a loading dock uh, the NO2 sensor, you can see where it's mounted down low, about 12 inches off the ground. And the CO sensor is mounted up high, about four, four or five feet off the ground. The picture on the right is in the same place, but in the underground parking, where the NO2 sensor is mounted right to the pillar, uh, 12 inches off the ground. And the CO sensor is going to be about four to five feet. Now here's a couple pictures where we're using just CO sensors. Now the picture on the left is, is very interesting because the contractor uh, decided that they wanted to flush mount these sensors. So they actually had boxes built and ran the conduit into the pillar before the concrete was formed so that they could just mount it right in there. And they did that so that there was no vandalism where somebody could come by and knock it off or it could be knocked off you know, inadvertently by a, uh, a side mirror or anything like that. The picture on the right is going to be the classical installation with, it, with the sensor mounted right on the pillar with the conduit running up through the ceiling. So earlier I mentioned how the Q5 can be used as a standalone sensor and a standalone controller. Because the Q5 and B5 have three relays built in uh, for small areas it, it can be very helpful if you don't have you know a control a central controller a building management system so here we have the q5 with a fan hooked up to relay one and a horn and strobe to relay two so uh, this in this scenario uh, let's say at 2500 parts per million you'd have your fan turn on and uh, at 90 parts per million, your horn and strobe com would come on. If you need the third relay, you could have this set up for like, uh, for instance, a, a third fan for a fresh air intake. So we do have a video on how this would work uh, using a Q5 sensor, a fan, and a strobe. I have this set up using uh, 25 parts per million as a first trip point second trip point at 90 and I'm using 100 ppm gas. So you're going to notice that this is going to go fast and it's going to go past that set point. I have a five second delay on there so that you know it just doesn't go on right away. So if that level is going right around that, that area you're not going to oscillate. And right here at uh, 90 parts per million you're going to see the strobe go on and alarm any people that are in that area.
And the second way the, M the uh, Q5 sensor can be used is with an M controller. Now the M controller is a, a central controller if you don't have a building management system. Uh, the Q5 can, or the M controller can take up to 32 Q5 sensors via RS-45. And it can take another eight sensors using analog inputs for a total of 40 sensors. Uh, it, it has three relays already built in, and the nice thing about the M, relay, M controller is if you need more relays, more relays can be added on. It can take up to 99 more relays. So we have, uh, again, a video that shows how the sensors would work with the M controller. And we have the fan and the strobe uh, using the same 100 ppm gas. Uh, you're going to see that kind of go fast past that. Uh, the relay trips, fan turns on. You can see the, the red LED. And at 80 parts per million, the strobe is going to come on. And again, depending upon how many fans, fans you need or relays you need, it could, be, could have different zones for, for different uh, ventilation. You, know, you could do uh, many different things with that. So once the sensors are installed, there's always the maintenance. And uh, we recommend that for combustible sensors, they be tested, bump tested every three months for functionality and to make sure the sensor is working the way it should. And every year, toxic sensors should be bump tested. And you're doing that to check the reading, to recalibrate if necessary, and to make sure that the sensor and the whole system is working the way it should, whether it be the, the fans, louvers, or strobes. Uh, if the sensor does need to be recalibrated, uh, ACI does uh, supply the ad calibration adapter, which is this right here. Uh, you will need a 0.5 liter per minute regulator and your zero in calibration gas. Uh, we recommend that you get the regulator and the zero in calibration gas from a local supplier. And if, there are, if you ever do have any questions on how to do anything, feel free to contact uh, ACI tech support. Now, I did mention earlier that the Q5, B5 do have a replaceable sensor module. Uh, once the sensor you know, is uh, worn out after you know, three to five year typical, a replacement is easy because all you have to do is just you know, undo a couple screws, take the old board off, and put the new board back on. Uh, there's no calibration necessary, so it makes it a plug and play type situation. But we do recommend that you carry some bump gas along and test it just to make sure it is working the way it should. Uh, ACI does carry a full line of gas detection, you know, from the Q5, B5 sensors to the M controller to the relays to add on to the M controller. And we also have uh, the Freon detection and the explosion proof sensors in the explosion proof housing. Uh, we'll have a, a, a webinar on this in the near future. Uh, all of ACI products are ISO 9000 certified for quality. So again, if you do have any questions with, uh, with tech support on gas or any of our products, uh, you know, feel free to you know, call us. Uh, you can talk to myself, Dave, uh, Matt, Kurt, or Rob Kapanos. We'll all be able to help you. Uh, if you do have any questions about price or availability on, it, on any of our gas detection products, uh, uh, please contact your ACI sales rep, and they'll be able to get you availability and pricing. So that brings us to the end of our webinar.